Hey guys, this is Elena from We Learn to Share. In this video, this is the third video of our review of AP English Language and Composition Glossary of Literal and Rhetorical Devices. And if you haven't seen the first and second video, I'll make sure to watch it and then come after to watch this third video. And we were continuing uh, on the figurative language, which is the opposite of a literal language, the types of figurative language over here. So uh, the last two would be synthesia, which is a description involving a crossing of the senses. The important thing is the senses, okay? So you can memorize this by having the same sin, like sense and sin over here. And examples of synthesia would be a purplish sense filled the room. So it's like a smell, right? It's through your nose. But it's a crossing of the senses because the smell is purple which is like a color and you see it by your eyes, right? So it's like a crossing of these senses or something that involves uh, oftentimes one or more senses or uh, the, the senses to describe something. Another example would be, I was def deafened by his brightly colored clothing, right? So over here, deafened means that like I became almost a kind of deaf, like I can't hear something. So this is a sense that involves your ear, right? hearing and over here the brightly colored so something that is brightly colored which you can sense by your eyes right so also over here you see how there's like a crossing of senses okay and that is what you call a type of figure language which is an aphasia and also you can look at personification which is like a giving human like qualities to something that is not human Okay, and this is very easy to memorize because it's basically uh, making some making something that is not a person like a person. So person, human-like qualities. And the example over here is that the tired old truck groaned as it inched up the hill, right? And over here, you can literally sense that this is personification because trucks are objects and trucks are cars. So they cannot be tired like a human, nor they could they could groan like a human, right? But you're just giving the human like qualities like being tired or groaning to something that is not a human, a truck, and that is called personification. Next is foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is when the author gives hints about what will occur later in the story, okay? It's like kind of predicting when the author gives hints about what will happen later in the story. So for example, let's say that main character in a certain story um, will die soon, okay? Will die later in the story, which is very uh, something very something that is very tragic to occur, right? And in this kind of story, the author can foreshadow the main character's death by giving hints in the first part. For example, like, oh, it was very like a rainy day. And it was everything was kind of gloomy, like making the tone, like making the settings very gloomy. And then like the character um, uh, was ill, but he felt that he's going to die soon or something like that. So it's like kind of when the author gives hints about what happened later in the story using several elements or certain um, devices. And next is general, which is the major category into which a literary work fits. So it's like a general or a major category. So the basic divisions of literature are prose, uh, which is the writings, like a book we see, or poetry and drama. However, genres can be subdivided as well. So poetry can be divided, classified into lyric, dramatic, narrative, etc. And the AP language exam deals primarily with the following genres, autobiography, biography, diaries, criticism, essays, and journalistic, political, scientific, and nature writing. And next, we're going to look at Gothic. Gothic is like writing characterized by um, gloom, mystery, fear, or death. And also refers to architectural style of the Middle Ages, often seen in the cathedrals of this period. Okay. Next, we're going to look at imagery. Imagery is like a word or words that create a picture in the reader's mind. And it's also easy to memorize because something that you can just remember that imagery is something that's evoked, that is very vivid or evocative, that helps the readers uh, think of an image or a picture of something, right? And usually this involves the five senses, okay? And the author often uses imagery in conjunction with metaphors, similes, or figures of speech because uh, by blending these together, it becomes really effective and very evocative or very vivid. The next is invective, which is a long, emotionally violent attack using strong, abusive language. So it's very kind of like emotionally violent, strong, abusive language. And you can see that how this word itself kind of feels like very offensive, right? It's like vecting, like 
invect like invade so that's how i remember memorize this word invective meaning um strong abusive language next we're going to look at irony so irony is something uh when the opposite of what you have expected to happen does and types of irony is this these three first the verbal irony so verbal irony would be something related to speaking because it said verbal right and when you say something and mean the opposite or something different that is called a verbal irony right so, for example, if your gym teacher wants you to run a mile in eight minutes or faster, but calls it a walk in the park, it would be a verbal irony because, um, like walking, running a mile in eight minutes or faster is something that's really, really hard, right? But they say, but, but when your gym culture calls that a walk in the park, which is supposed to be really quiet and like kind of, kind of peaceful and like not rushing stuff, uh, it would be something that your gym teacher saying something the right opposite of something, right? Uh, and if, you're, if your voice tone is a, a bitter, it's called sarcasm. And another type of irony over here is dramatic irony. And this is when the audience of a drama, play, movie, etc. know something that the character doesn't and would be surprised to find out, okay? So this is when the audience knows something, but the character doesn't know something. For example, in many horror movies, we, the audience, know who the killer is, which the victim-to-be has no idea who is doing the slaying, okay? And sometimes the character trusts the killer completely, when ironically, he or she shouldn't, because um, the killer will kill him, perhaps. And one prominent example of dramatic irony is like the Romeo and Juliet, right? The famous tragedy of Shakespeare. Um, you can see how like when the when Juliet um like gets a portion and then like use it to see that she's dead in order to escape with Romeo, um, and then she drinks the portion and then she falls asleep. We the audience know that Juliet seems like she's dead and she's pretending to be dead, right? But the characters like the Romeo and Julia's family doesn't know that, right? They think that Juliet is really dead. And that's why Romeo also kills himself in front of Juliet because he thought that Juliet is dead. But we, the audience, knew that Juliet isn't really dead. So it's something like that. It's a situation like that. We'd call, we call it dramatic irony. When, when the audience knows something, but the character doesn't know that. And the last type of irony we're going to see is situational irony. And this is found in the plot or storyline of a book story or movie. And sometimes it makes you laugh because it's funny how things turn out. Okay, so it's something that is found in the plot and it can sometimes make you laugh. For example, let's say that Johnny spent two hours planning on sneaking into the movie theater because he maybe didn't have money and missed the movie. But when he finally did manage to sneak inside, he found that kids were admitted free that day. So it's something that's really funny, right? Um, Johnny didn't need to like uh, try that hard and put on efforts for, for two hours to sneak into the movie theater because he, he could just like enter the movie theater because he's a kid and he could uh, be a mid free that day. But what he did was kind of funny and it's kind of ironic, right? Next is juxtaposition. And this is placing things side by side for the purpose of comparison. Okay. An author often used this of ideas or examples in order to make a point. So, for example, an author may juxtapose, uh, may juxtapose the average day of a typical American with that of someone in the third world in order to make a comparison, make a point of social commentary, right? So, it's basically just really placing things side by side and comparing these two. You call it juxtaposition. The next is mood. And mood is basically, yeah, the atmosphere, like the tone, mood, created by the literature and accomplished through word choice, diction. And syntax is often a creator of mood since word order, sentence, sentence length, and strength and complexity also affect pacing and therefore mood. And setting tone and events also can all affect the mood. Next is motif. Motif is like a recurring idea in a piece of literature, okay? You can memorize the motif as something that is recurring idea. And in To Kill a, Kill a Mockingbird, the idea that you never really eat another person until you consider things from his or her point of view is a motive because the idea is brought up several times over the course of the novel. So you can think motive as the topic or like the lesson the author wants to give to the people um, through his writings or through his work. So you can remember that motive is something that is a recurring idea. 
Next, we're going to look at oxymoron, which is when apparently contradictory terms are grouped together and suggest a paradox, okay? So it's when a apparently contradictory terms are grouped together. It doesn't make any sense if you um, interpret it literally. So, for example, why is full? I mean, someone who is wise and someone who is full uh, would be the right opposite because wise means smart and full means being stupid. But you can just pair these two together um, for a certain reason or to imply certain lessons and to such and such that thereby such as a paradox, like a wise full. Or also eloquent silence or jumbo shrimp, okay? Because jumbo is big and the shrimp is small. And so oxymoron is when the author apparently uh, pairs the contradictory terms together and such as a paradox. And lastly, we're going to look at pacing. So pacing is basically the speed or the tempo of the author's writing. And writers can use a variety of devices, the syntax, um, polysyndeton, anaphora, or meter to change the pacing of their words. And the author's pacing can be fast, sluggish, stopping, vibrato, staccato, measured, etc. So you can just remember that pacing, pacing of the writing is the speed or tempo of the author's writing. So how fast the story um, is being elaborated upon or narrated upon and could be, uh, could be different based on the author's pacing. And yeah, this would be the end of this video. And thanks for watching and see you in the next video.